Welcome, everyone. So I'm really excited that we have uh, Susan Effie here today from Stanford. For her, it's uh, quite early in the morning, so I'm happy that she made it. <laughs> Uh, Susan is the Economics of Technology Professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from Duke University and her PhD from Stanford. She previously taught at MIT, Stanford and Harvard. She worked for several years as consulting chief economist at Microsoft, which I find very interesting. Um, she's an elected member of the National, National Academy of Science and uh, she's the recipient of the John Bates Clark Medal. Finally, Susan is an associate director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. And today she will be talking about using neural sequence models to represent sequences of human decisions. Great, thanks so much. And thanks for having me here. And I have to apologize for not giving a health talk today, um, but I, I have been working on some health data for, for the last years around COVID. Um, but at this point, the, that's not the latest and greatest as papers are published. So I'm on to uh, present a, 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 some work that I think is very applicable to health data, um, but I'm going to be using a, a labor market application today. Um, and I, before I get started on my talk today, I'll also advertise that um, I have a lot of material on causal inference um, which is not going to be my main focus today, but if anyone is interested in combining machine learning and AI and causal inference, um, I have tutorials, I have YouTube videos. If you can't find them on Google, please feel free to, um, to reach out. Okay, so let me share my screen and I will uh, get started. All right, does that look okay? Yes, perfect. Great, okay. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about learning um, a model for career trajectories for economic decision-making. And uh, this is joint work with a bunch of people in my lab. Um, the lead author is Kian Vafa, who is a doctoral student at Columbia in computer science. And he's working under the direction of David Bly, who many of you know um, from uh, his work in AI. So the, our motivation is, is about looking at longitudinal um, survey data sets for economics, which is where, where survey data sets are um, the most common form of data that we use to study labor market and public policy outcomes in economics. So in a survey, we might have people filling out over time, they fill it out in a particular year, they find out their occupation, their educational degree and their wages, then we come back and survey them again. Um, and over a long period of time, we've gathered a history about them. Now, these of course are very expensive to carry out. And so we do them generally for small samples, especially in the US. Um, there is in several European or especially Nordic countries, um, we have administrative data about the whole population, which provides a lot of this data in a, in a much larger scale, but for smaller countries. And so actually a lot of economic research about labor markets and public policies takes place in you know, Norway and Sweden and Denmark because we have data there. Um, and, but in studying that, that leaves out economies like the, the US where we have not got that data um, organized. And we, so they tend to have thousands of respondents. The longitudinal surveys are constructed to be nationally representative and we es use them to estimate economic quantities, um, things like gender or racial differences in, un in unemployment, um, wage gaps. So trying to understand say why women are paid less than men, um, trends in occupational segregation, um, and lots of other things, inequality, um, and people use these data to look at, you know, impacts of public policies. So in the US, the two of the big ones are the NLSY and the PSID. Um, and those are, are, again, people, researchers can apply to use them, and so they're commonly used. 
We also have a larger cross-sectional, repeated cross-sectional data sets, but they're not good for studying the evolution of people's careers. Um, and so these are used, you know, for all sorts of things in, in, in research. So if we think about what's coming out of those data sets, we can, we can sort of conceptualize these as sequences. So we're going to take each individual worker and we can think of their sequence of careers. So in 1990, they're a cashier, then they're a sales representative, then they're a manager, and so on. So, you know, as, as many of you know, I focus a lot on causal inference. So I think of prediction as a means to an end. Um, but even if you're going to be doing causal inference, um, the, the predictive component of the model is very important. And that's really where the AI and machine learning come in and shine in terms of improving the quality of our models, because we want to predict counterfactually, you know, what would have happened if something had been different. Um, and so one, one of the things that, you know, if we're studying employment as an outcome, we might want to predict employment status for different kinds of workers. Um, we, we might want to simulate what counterfactual occupational outcomes would be in the absence of interventions like training or like minimum wage um, or in, if they hadn't had economic shocks of various types. And of course, there's also direct applications of prediction in economics. Um, we may want to forecast which occupations are going to have rising or declining market shares. Um, and we, we might want to understand, um, you know, which workers are going to be impacted if we have, you know, a new factory built or if we, if, if some businesses go away due to environmental regulation or other types of policies that we put in. So having more accurate predictions will improve the quality of our analyses. So a major problem in building predictive models from these data sets is that they're small. Um, the US ones contain only thousands of workers. So in practice, you know, economists have been doing, working with data for all these years. We get sort of like health researchers, we get kind of annoyed when people imply that machine learning and AI invented the use of data <laughs> to answer questions. Um, so we've been working with these for a long time, um, but we've made a lot of compromises in our analysis due to the small data set size and also due to the lack of, or the, the kind of the conventions to use simple tools like linear regressions. So we typically fit simple linear models um, that are Markov, like first order Markov. So they, you just look at what, where you are today and model where you're gonna go tomorrow. And then history matters just via a few hand constructed summary statistics. So a labor market model might predict, are you employed in school or unemployed? So take like three state variables and then look at that as a function of, you know, um, you know, some of your industry and broad occupational categories, maybe 10 occupational categories or something and, and educational categories that you, and you sort of summarize the history um, by hand. Um, and so the question is, are there better models that capture complex career trajectories than these kind of hand constructed models. And certainly um, in my work with health data, we have a very analogous type of thing where, you know, you might have historical data on people from their insurance billing records over time, and you tend to simplify and the, the history into, you know, do you have this, do you have this, pre-existing condition? Do you have that condition? Um, you know, how many times have you been to the hospital in the last year and so on? So we, we've tended historically in, in to 
use hand constructed um, covariates from, for that purpose. And I mentioned, I've been working with medical data in COVID. Um, one of the things I was doing was trying to look at whether to try to prioritize um, uh, pre, you know, previously um, approved drugs for clinical trials around COVID. And so we used claims data to look at people who had been admitted for respiratory illnesses in the past. And then we tried to see whether drugs they had already been taking um, led to better outcomes. So one of the things I studied was alpha blockers. Lots of men are taking alpha blockers for prostate conditions. And so we looked at whether people who were admitted to the hospital with pneumonia who were also taking alpha blockers were better we had better outcomes than people who weren't. We found some promising results in those observational studies. And, but by the time we narrowed down to pneumonia patients that were men of a certain age, you know, we had reasonably small data sets. And so even though we used some machine learning in those studies, um, we were still using hand, hand constructed summaries of the past of those workers. And of course, for a lot of the, the biostatistics publications and so on, we're trying to keep things simple so that people will understand them as well. And I'm not gonna solve that problem here. <laughs> the fact that if you use fancy methods, it still may be a little bit harder to publish. Um, the, okay, so when I think about what's, um, what gives us a new opportunity in this, um, in this labor market setting, recently, we've gotten a different source of data available in the US and those are large resume data sets. So the resume data sets are available because people post them on LinkedIn and uh, other kinds of job posting sites. And then there are a bunch of companies that aggregate that data and, and use it to create products. And so they also sell this for to researchers. And so that's what we're using here is this resume data. So from the resume data, you can also impute people's job sequences. It's a there's a little bit more measurement error than you might have in a survey, um, because people can leave things off their resumes. Um, so this is all self reported, and you might just have gaps. And, and not know exactly when things started and ended, or you might have overlaps. But what these resume scraping companies do is they you know, have a bunch of heuristics they use to translate this um, resume data into, um, into sequences of jobs. And for that, we have millions. So here we're gonna have 23 million resumes where we only have you know, a few thousand people in the government surveys that we have available. So in terms of looking at job sequence models, there's, there's some pros that these data sets are large. And so that's gonna allow us to study much smaller events. So for example, if you wanted to look at the effect of something like layoffs in survey data, it's very unlikely that you're gonna have a lot of people working in a particular job, in a particular industry, in a particular city at a particular time. But these larger data sets, you're gonna catch a lot of people. So if, if, a, if an, a single firm has layoffs, you'll be able to see the, the, the outcome from those layoffs. And I should say, I've been studying plant closures in Sweden. Um, and so, in Sweden, because you have all the data, you can study the plant closures, but there's still going to be only a few thousand people who are really impacted by a specific set of plant closures in a small country um, like Sweden. And of course, Sweden's different than the US because it has a much better social safety net and so on. So, and fewer places that people can move. So it doesn't, you know, we don't, we don't get the same kinds of effects necessarily. Um, but the problem is it's not, they're not these, the people who post their resumes online aren't representative. And of course they may be inaccurate as well. So that's not perfect data. And so it's gonna be hard to say that, you know, X percent of the population had Y percent impact from this non-representative data. 
The survey has its representative and it's fully curated and carefully collected and checked and it's been checked many times people understand the strengths and weaknesses because you know, tens of thousands of papers have been written on these data sets, um, but they're small. So the question is, you know, is there a way to leverage these abundance of resumes um, for survey data set analyses? Um, so just highlighting again those challenges, first we want to get better models beyond these simple hand-picked models that will capture long-term career trajectories. And in particular, can we do that when we have these large data sets? Um, but then can we use those, can we combine the survey data sets and the, and the resume data sets in a way that we get better, we get reliable and representative results? So let me now take, take an analogy to health, which I'm sure you guys can all fill in these details yourself. So not to state the obvious, um, but nonetheless, just for completeness, um, we can think about, first of all, the, this, especially in, in the causal inference side of, of health, um, you know, we are also using these hand, hand curated models. Um, and the, the reasons are similar that, you know, we're, we're limited on data often by the time we get down to a particular diagnosis and, you know, a particular um, data set we're interested in. And especially if we're trying to get, look at detailed things like, um, like uh, uh, you know, notes from a chart or more detailed information about people's um, vital signs and stuff, we often end up with small data sets. But then there are other large data sets that are noisier. Um, in the US, we have these health claims data sets that are, that, that are aggregated across lots and lots of insurance providers. They're not representative because in the US, richer people have insurance um, and they don't have a lot of fine grained information and they miss things, but they're larger. Um, and then we might have a curated clinical data set that we put together for a study population. So, you know, researchers at a hospital might see all the vital signs of, of everything, or they might be doing a randomized trial where they've, they've, um, curated the people and they've randomized treatment control groups. So it's a high quality data set um, that, that's very meaningful. But when you, once you get to these high quality curated data sets, they're so small that you, you can't really do much model, data-driven model selection. You know, if you have a couple hundred people splitting your sample in half to, you know, to get valid model selection and so on, you're losing a lot of a lot of um, a lot of your observations. So these are these are some applications I can think of where this type of problem would would come in, and I'm sure there are others too. But I think this 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 setting of these these large non-representative and in, I think in the case of medical data, often just have less fields populated, basically, it, and also having access to smaller, more detailed. Um, or more curated data sets at the same time is a pretty common um, setup. So, um, so as you all very well know, um, there have been extremely rapid innovation in the last few years in natural language processing. And you know, the state of the art models from just a couple of years ago have now been um, made obsolete by a newer generation. Now, the shelf life of what we have now um, may also be short. There may be new things coming along because it's such a hot area. Um, but nonetheless, there have been a lot of rapid advances. And so those NLP advances are just now getting kind of ported over to other applications. So the, in particular, transformer neural networks um, have gotten very popular and they successfully model sequences of words in natural language processing. And my co-author, David Bly um, at Columbia is an expert in natural language processing. So that's in one of our areas of collaboration have been translating his natural language processing innovations into um, causal inference and into economic applications. So he and I have another line of work where we translate neural um, NLP methods into um, 
consumer choice models for looking at the impact of price changes. Um, so now we're bringing them into labor. So transformer neural networks have successfully modeled sequences of words. So, you know, if you trying to do words in a sentence, the, the transformer is trying to predict what happens in that sentence. Um, so we're going to develop a transformer for modeling sequences of jobs in a career. Now, um, the second piece is transfer learning. And so what we want to do is learn from a very large data set and get representations taking advantage of the, the richness of the resume data. But then we want to fine tune them onto survey data sets. So what we're going to do is learn representations of careers on this large millions of data set, millions of resumes in the big data set. And then we're gonna take as output a representation function of the resumes. So we're gonna be able to take each resume, um, apply this function and come up with a low dimensional representation, um, which could then be stuck into a regression model if that's what economists are more familiar with. And again, I wanna, you know, highlight if you're trying to cross disciplinary boundaries like everybody does in health, you know, you're, you can imagine having this two-part analysis where there's a bit of a black box and your, some of your reviewers aren't very, don't really know or care how the black box works, but they can understand that you've created a covariate vector, which then goes into a regression um, or, or is used to adjust for differences in a clinical trial. Um, so this, this two-step approach can be um, easier from an expositional standpoint. Um, but what we want to do, of course, if we, people might still wonder if you learned your representation from this big non-representative data set, um, you know, maybe rich people are overrepresented, maybe different racial groups are overrepresented, there could be hidden biases, there could be other problems with using these representations. And so actually solving all those problems we, is not something we've completely done yet. It's not something the NLP people have completely done yet. So that's you know, current research to figure out how to make sure these representations are fair and even define what that means. That's a frontier research project. But what we can do is try to make sure that they are appropriate for the smaller survey data sets. And also, we might have different covariates in the smaller data sets. In the, so we might want to fine tune the models to incorporate the additional data, the richer data that we have. So the way the fine tuning works is we take as input this representation function, and so that's pre-trained. And then the output would be a fine tuned representation and prediction function, which again, could incorporate all the differences in that, um, in that curated data set. Now, um, this of course is something that this, this whole concept is not novel. Nothing here I've said, I mean, I'm sorry if I'm putting you to sleep. All of this is you know, standard stuff um, to do, but the transformer models, it turns out have just performed better at doing these tasks, these specific tasks than existing models. So in the NLP space, um, we what we've seen is the there have been these big language models that people have trained on large, uh, you know, tech company data sets and tech company infrastructure, or you know, these other large groups of people have come up with these models, and then people are been have been fine tuning them for specialized applications. And that's become a whole cottage industry with hundreds of papers um, doing that. So we're calling our approach a uh, career, um, which is short for contextual attention-based representations of employment encoded from resumes. Had to twist a little bit to make it uh, something that uh, makes sense, um, but we, I think we did it. So our approach is career. And so the idea is that we could train a model and even release the representations we've trained from these larger data sets, and then people can fine tune them for specific applications. And again, you can imagine doing that also with some of the large health data sets. Now, there's a bunch of issues also about privacy there, which 
these resumes are posted online, so we don't have the same privacy considerations of the risk of, you know, the risk of revealing a resume. Well, that resume is already public. So you also need to layer on some notions of privacy to this if you're going to do it with health data. And that is also a, you know, sort of current topic, but it's one reason that I haven't, you know, done this yet myself. Um, but that I, there, the tools are out there. And so it's a, magic, a matter of sort of piecing together the tools of differential privacy and fairness um, on top of these representations. So my guess is that over the next few years, people will start releasing representations of more private data sets um, and, and that, that will become a thing in, in medicine. But that's one reason I don't have an application like that to show you now. Um, because I would have to, you know, you'd have to get approval and you'd have to somehow show that you're not, you know, somehow memorizing people's individual data. So the, in, for the, for the, for, and so for why a transformer, well, these in NLP in the last couple of years, these transformers have replaced recurrent neural nets and long short-term memory models as the sequence model of choice. And of course, as usual in AI and machine learning, that's a um, that's a performance based thing. It's you know we we go back and figure out why <laughs> after we see what wins. So, um, but they've there've been really two things. First of all, they've been better in modeling sequences in large data sets. So that's where the, the the gap really starts to show up. And they've also been doing really well in fine tuning onto smaller data sets. And so that's why there's this huge industry of variations of BERT and other types of, of things, because it, this has been something that's really successful. And so one research team after another has grabbed these models and fine tuned them and gotten good performance and published them. So if you haven't been following the details of the NLP revolution, um, again, you have to, this is all, a bit of an opinion, um, but some intuition for the difference between the models is that the RNNs and the LSTMs are recurrent. And what that means is that the information between tokens travels through an evolving hidden state. So as you're adding in words of the sentence, you're coming up with a low dimensional representation and that representation is evolving, but all of the the information about the um, you know previous words is going through that hidden state, and it's it's not as good at getting fine grained details of the sequence of words and how they relate to each other in the sentence. While in transformer models, each token has its own hidden state, and Crucially, each token can attend to any previous token. So a particular word in a sentence can just, it, we can, we, we're gonna learn how its interpretation depends on previous words in the sentence. So it seems like a minor detail and all of these things, you know, you can explain them in a way that makes them sound brilliant. Um, so again, this is mostly just a performance-based thing. This is an interpretation of what's different about the architecture of transformers and why they perform well. Um, but in general, they appear to be, and this is what all everybody's numerical experiments show, is that they're better at modeling long-term dependencies and can train more efficiently in that kind of a context when there are long-term dependencies. So these have been ex successfully applied to sequences other than text. They've, they've gone to images, music, and molecular chemistry, among others. Um, so we're the first to put them onto labor models. Um, the most recent application that we're aware of um, from NLP into labor models are LSTMs um, from a couple of years ago. Um, and then we've also seen these types of applications in um, electronic health record sequence data. Um, and there've been a couple of, of papers and, and a, a recent survey um, using recurrent neural nets in this setting. And of course, you people on the call might know papers I'm missing. So please um, email me if you've seen things that I didn't find in my literature review, because I only focused on health literature review closely for this talk. Um, 
the, the, there's a, um, but the, one of the most recent papers that, that was a transformer model. This was one that I found um, from Lee et al. And they used 1.6 million individuals and found that transformers were outperforming these baselines um, at disease prediction. But it seems like this is also relatively nascent in the health area. So it seems like there's a little bit of work here, probably at the next conference, there'll be more because that's the way the, this all rolls. Um, but it seems like this, this analogy of that we're gonna, gonna exploit in labor where people have been using RNNs and now they're gonna find that transformers work better is also gonna be the case in, in health. Um, so actually, before I go into specifics, I do just wanna highlight there's another parallel between labor and health which I'm not solving today. And I've said this a couple of times, is that when you really go to apply these for policy, you really, you have to think about privacy in some cases, and you have to think about fairness. You have to think about biases. Um, you know, people care about the numbers. In, if you go to NeurIPS or ICML and look at all the papers, you know, people look at your mean squared error or your, perplexity or your, you know, they're just goodness of fit. And I'm going to be a little more in the machine learning school today um, because we're building this foundation with this paper. But the papers I'm working on that I'm going to publish in economics journals, I've got to solve those problems and I've got to demonstrate, you know, how I, how well I do with different subpopulations and how I do with vulnerable populations and so on. So one of the reasons I think it's really important that um, you know, health domain specialists collaborate with computer scientists and engineers is that the health domain specialists are going to keep pushing the machine learners to, um, to address the challenges that are required for taking this over the finish line. So I'm presenting today my foundational work. And a lot of times in my cross-disciplinary teams, like Kian's a computer science student. So he's, we, we write one paper for the computer science audience that is more in the computer science style, but then we also write papers for the social science audience. So, and, and often the computer science and engineers are, are, find it really interesting to dive into these other objectives because they're so used to just getting goodness of fit and you're done. And these supplementary analyses where you cut out your data and look at fit across different categories and look at calibration and try to think about biases are, you, is, are interesting and they make the machine learning work more exciting and more intellectually stimulating. So it, I find these collaborations um, really helpful, even though I'm in my talk today, I'm not going to show you all of that today, but in my, like my supermarket papers, um, we, we do a fair bit of sort of, of a, a, ways of assessing the performance of the model that are non-standard. Like if we're trying to look at, use the model to look at the impact of price changes, we hold out data isolated to where there are price changes. And we try to see whether people we predict are more price sensitive are more likely to be impacted by price changes. So we slice and dice our goodness of fit in order to, to highlight its performance at these more complicated tasks, decision-making tasks often. All right, so now let's get into the specifics. So for the occupation models, our goal is to map a, a career history into a probability distribution over their next job. And so for some of the things, like if we're predicting out, we wanna use that full probability distribution because we wanna think about a probability distribution over where they are in five years. The jobs are encoded into categories and we have covariates like their educational degrees. So formally, YT is gonna be their job at time T. The vector bold YT is all the jobs up to time T. Little XT or italic XT is the covariates at time T while the bold is all the covariates up to time T. And so an occupation model is gonna be the probability that somebody's in a particular occupation given their history of, of jobs and their covariates, their full vector of covariates. And again, in the, in the medical context, the, these X covariates um, would be, you know, things about they can, some of them won't change over time, like somebody's gender or their age will just be evolving over time. Um, but they may have other things like insurance status or where they're living. 
Um, and then the whys would be the sequences of, um, of kind of medical uh, states. And so we're trying to, in this case, we're building a predictive model to predict the next clinical outcome, or in this case, the next job. So what's typically been done, it would be a first order Markov occupation model that depend, that assumes the jobs depends only on the most recent job. So we, you would just look back one period and then potentially just have a couple of summary covariates that capture everything else. Um, and of course, what's the problem is the working history beyond the most recent job does inform future transitions. So ideally the model should condition on the full job history to make predictions. And so the fully contextual model is what we're gonna be looking for. Um, but it's infeasible to directly condition on it because there's exponentially many combinations and permutations. So what we've seen people do in the empirical literature, again, is boil things down to you know, a dozen industries or a few occupations to, to make this, the state space small. What we want to do instead is, a, a, is learn this low dimensional representation of jobs. Um, and so we're gonna, we want to we want to get a representation that carries all the relevant information for predicting the the next job. So we can use that to predict the next job. So we're going to take the full history, put it through the transformer, get this vector of of uh, that's uh, their representation, and um, put it right into the next job. We're not going to try to interpret that representation, although. You could, um, and sometimes that's a fruitful exercise, but really we're just thinking of it as just a, as a black box. So the intuition is if two career paths are similar, but not identical, the predicted next jobs should be similar. And so predicting jobs based on representations will allow for sharing information. Um, and so we can look and see what, how similar these are based on our learned representations. So here's an example of um, two, two histories where the cosine similarity of our representations are very close. So here in, on the left, we have a resume that student unemployed secretary statistical clerk. On the right, we have student typist, administrative support job typist. And so our, repre our representations are gonna say that those two histories are very similar. The ones below have a cosine similarity of 0.98. We have a health nursing aide, then secretary, then out of the labor force. And then on the right, we have a health nursing aide and then a receptionist and then out of the labor force. So those are, are two different career trajectories that are going to look very similar from our standpoint. So, we wanna use this to predict the next job. Um, and so we're gonna have some differences that are based on the specific context of resumes. Although again, some of these are gonna have a, a, an analogy in health and we wanna find a good representation function. And then we wanna do the transfer learning. So one of the key things that, that comes up and we found this in a bunch of different contexts is that Outside of language, where you're always you're usually getting a different word from one word to the next, in many other contexts, there's this big state, which is that things stay the same and don't change. Or when you're shopping, there's this big state, which is you don't purchase. So most people don't purchase most things when they go to the store. And most people, you know, if they're online, they don't purchase at all. So we want to really focus on this. Um, this a two-stage model because getting the zeros right the, or the no changes right is really important, but it can sort of overwhelm a model and have and if you're not careful, everything you do is just going to focus the lack of change and you won't get a representation that um, that is is tailored to the change when it does occur. So we have we use a two-stage approach. In stage one, we predict whether an individual changes jobs. And in stage two, we predict the specific job an individual might transition to. So we can define this, this state as whether they change jobs. So ST is one if they change jobs and ST is zero otherwise. So in the first stage, we predict whether they change. 
And so that's going to be just, um, you know, this modeling this as a zero one as some function of our representation. So remember H of the history is a representation and there's gonna be coefficients on that, uh, that, that um, weight that re the representation, the elements of the representation for the purpose of predicting whether they change jobs. So there's gonna be regression coefficients that are gonna help us understand which elements of this representation are important for whether you change, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna when we, we can think about where, you know, the analogy would be, we could just have a logistic regression where we directly learn coefficients on all of the things about your past as predicting whether you're gonna change. The only difference here is that now we have this lower dimensional representation of the past, um, but we're still gonna have regression coefficients. So it's gonna be like we're running a logistic regression, but instead of on the full history, just on the representation of that history. And the second stage, we're gonna, we're gonna basically run a multinomial logistic regression, where again, we have um, a regression coefficients that weight these representations. So it's exactly the same as running the multi-domain logistic regression, except we've just reduced the dimensionality um, to this lower dimensional vector. And then of course, for like, as usual with a multinomial logistic, for each, for each um, job J, there can be different coefficients on those Xs. Um, and then uh, otherwise you're just gonna stay in the same job. And so you could think here, like you're treating a patient over time and they may be you know, in remission from cancer or they may be just in a regular state of treatment for maintaining a chronic condition. And so we would be modeling you know, whether they stay in that state or whether they move to a new state would be this type of transition model. So then we wanna build this um, transformer model um, and which were developed for NLP. Um, as we, I mentioned, there's a bunch of these that are popular. And so we're gonna do this for sequences of jobs. And so we're gonna adopt this transformer to the repeats. I already talked about that. We're also gonna bring in covariates. So of course you can bring in covariates to a language model too. Like it could be that we could, you know, what time of day this sentence is spoken to a chat bot could be important, you know, who the doctor is, what the characteristics is an older young doctor. So, you, but, but we're going to, the covariates will be very important in, in the, the career setting. And I think they would also be important in the medical setting. Um, so we're going to build this using this career um, representation model. The way that's going to work is that it starts out, it's, it's going to use a stack of layers, and we start out, the first layer is going to take a look at your current job and covariates. So for each, there's going to be, it, it, we're going to have a, 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 a build up layers, and each layer would apply to different times in the sequence. So in the first layer, where each of the of the um, these are depending on the contemporaneous information, the contemporaneous covariates, and the most recent history. Just this is the italic Y is just one period of history. So they're attending to the recent um, time. Then, as we as we um, we bring in attention, we can then have say the the most recent period can pay. Um, an amount of attention that's learned to different, um, different times historically. Then we use a feed forward neural net and add in layers where again, each of these it can, we can learn how much attention they should pay to the other periods of history and so on until we get to the top layer. And then we've, we've brought all of this information together and then we, what, where we're going in the end is this representation that's going to predict whether um, what your next job is. And so it's this, this, these, this, the way in which the attention is distributed and the way in which you learn the attention in this dynamic setting is sort of the magic of the transformers. So we're gonna get to estimate all these parameters, but if we tried to do this directly on the survey data sets, they overfit. So we use transfer learning where we first fit career with large resume data sets with stochastic gradient descent and then we fine tune them on the small survey data sets where we just initialize at the large, at the, at the 
initial representation. Now, this is a really crazy thing because we don't really understand why or how this works. And you could imagine theoretically lots of reasons it could go wrong. So it's still a little bit magic why this works so well, but it seems to work well across lots of applications. So now we're, we're ready to see what we can do with that, um, we, where, we, where we can do this fine tuning. Um, we, and again, this is something that's been very successful in NLP. So we're gonna compare in our empirical study, first and second order Markov models, where you just care about last job and the job before that, linear regression with handcrafted summary statistics. And here we're gonna copy the handcrafted summary statistics that have been used in the literature, a bag of job model, the conditions on all jobs, but combines them linearly. Um, uh, an LSTM neural network applied directly to the survey data sets. And then ours, which is the fine tuned from the resume data. So again, the resumes, we have 24 million and we have, we have about um, 10,000 in the survey data sets. Um, we have some more data about unemployment in the survey data sets. Um, they're at slightly different time periods, especially the first NLSY. Um, they have more manual labors in the survey data sets, and we have more covariates available in the survey data sets. Um, so these are going to be, and I think, again, these representations would be similarly different for health data sets. I mean, these, the representativeness would be similar for like insurance data sets versus, say, a hospital data set. So um, we, for all experiments, we used um, train, validate, and test, and we're gonna evaluate predictive performance with held out perplexity. So if you haven't used perplexity before, it's just a monotone transformation of log likelihood, but the magnitude is interpretable. So a model with, perplex say, perplexity 10 performs as well as a model that is uniformly uncertain under 10 alternatives. So if there's a thousand possible occupations, and you have perplexity of 10, it's saying this model is basically lowered things down, narrowed things down to 10 possible jobs. So we pre-train the career on resumes and fine tune on survey data sets. And here we look at the perplexity across all these different models and we get very substantial improvements. So again, the regression can narrow things down to 15 and a half jobs um, in the NLSY 97, while the career narrows things down to 14.15 jobs. And so it's a, it's a pretty substantial improvement. Um, it takes 18 hours to pre-train on resumes, but only seven to 23 minutes to fine tune each survey data set on a single GPU. So that also means that you could, pop, again, some, somebody can make a big effort to, to use a big data set, but then researchers can have a hope of doing this on their own, um, on their own machines with small data sets. We can look at the performance and see how the performance varies as a function of the pre-training data set size. And so having more pre-training examples um, really makes a pretty big difference and it keeps falling um, even in the range of that we have. So the value of additional data is, is still strong. It's a power law and that's similar to what we found in NLP. We can look at a few examples here to see why it does well. So here's a sequence from our data where somebody has been an animal caretaker, then a student, a student, an engineering technician, and a student. And we're predicting that they're a biological technician. So the animal caretaker puts the thumb on the scale in terms of that you're in the, the biology side of things. Um, and so the regression puts the biological technician 41st, the bag of jobs 38th, but the career model puts it second. And that's because this context of being an animal caretaker in the context of studying and being an engineering technician together makes the biological technician the, the right um, prediction. Of course, that's a cherry picked example, of course. Um, the career can not only predict the next job, it can forecast many years in the future. So you, it, it can project how you climb the ladder from being an office clerk. And we find that in forecasting two, four, and six years out, the gaps are, are particularly large. So, the, so you're doing even better. The, the gaps are sort of growing as you go further out in time. Although, of course, all the, um, all the, the uh, models do badly you know, six years out um, relative to two years out. And so they're best at making forecasts, and the advantage is greater there, the absolute advantage. Um, 
The career learns representations of job segments that can be also useful for different downstream tasks. So we look at wages on observables. And here we might think about, you know, you could model the, the specific clinical histories, but then you might want to have the final outcome be, you know, your, whether you're alive in 10 years or, you know, what are your total medical expenditures, um, not just the, se the sequence of outcomes. So, so here we, um, we run a simple regression of your wage on covariates and this representation. And we find a substantial improvement in mean squared error from including these representations relative to the regression models that people had already been using. And again, in health, you could imagine something similar. The X's are like the hand curated things that everybody has agreed upon should be in regressions. And here we're getting this value added from adding this representation in, in terms of mean squared error of wages. Well, the whole representation wasn't even learned on wages. So this would, I think this again would have an analogy in health data. So here's an example where the career outperforms the baseline. Um, they had, again, previous, in this case, previous jobs, engineering technician, computer scientist, computer systems analyst. The wage, the true wage was $48 an hour. The predicted wage without career was $26 an hour, but with career, um, we got up to $38 an hour. So understanding the full sequence of previous jobs um, un helped you understand that this was someone, this manager administrator would have a very high wage. So open questions. Um, you know, how does the noisiness and non-representative of the resume data affect downstream predictions? How similar do they need to be to yield valid predictions? What's the trade-off between using a transformer and simpler models that are easier to understand, especially once we layer in these extra desiderata like fairness? So just to summarize, our survey data sets produce sequences. They're important for predictive models. We propose career, which takes its inspiration from modern NLP, it leverages these large scale data sets um, to learn useful representations. They outperform common economic baselines when predicting and forecasting. Um, and our code is available um, on GitHub if somebody's interested. So I'll stop here, thanks.